Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, very special day to celebrate our 2018 Ogawa Yamanaka Stem Cell Prize uh, winner, Marius Wernig. Uh, this is a special day for the international stem cell community uh, to celebrate uh, some of the achievements of scientists who are really pushing the borders to really to be able to make a difference using cellular reprogramming technologies to affect human disease. Uh, this award, the Ogawa Yamanaka Prize, was inspired by Hiro and Betty Ogawa several years ago, and you'll hear more about them and uh, what inspired them. Uh, but they really wanted to uh, create a prize that, that celebrated the efforts of scientists who are trying to make a difference specifically using cellular reprogramming technologies, as I mentioned. And uh, today we have the folks in this audience here uh, to witness this, but we also have an online audience. So I welcome all the guests who are uh, watching online around the world. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge our selection committee, which is also an international one uh, that helps select the uh, uh, awardee each year. Uh, this year, the, the award committee was composed of myself, uh, George Daly, Hideyuki Okana, Lawrence Studer, a past winner, Fiona Watt, and uh, Shinya Yamanaka. The uh, awards that we're uh, are giving <clears throat> are really ones that uh, try to select from people all around the world. And Hiro and Betty also wanted us to not just award the most senior people in the field, uh, but also to just look for breakthroughs. And it didn't matter at what level of their training or education or their education their, or, and status they were. And this year's awardee is one of our youngest uh, to date, uh, and you'll hear more about uh, that in a moment as well. Um, so Marius, who's our uh, awardee this year, uh, is somebody I've known for about 10 years. He was just reminding me earlier today of when we first met, when he was a postdoc in Boston, and I had given a talk there, and he came up to introduce himself as he was just was on the job market. Um, I was a few months late, uh, because by the time I contacted him, he had accepted a job at Stanford, uh, where he's been ever since. Uh, but prior to that, uh, Mar Marius was, uh, had grown up in Vienna, uh, and had done his MD and PhD work at the University of Munich. Uh, his PhD work was with Rudy Balling. He then uh, did a neuropathology residency at the University of Bonn, so he's a fully trained uh, pathologist, uh, and then came to the United States where he did a postdoctoral fellowship with Rudolf Janisch, and it was there that he began to work uh, on stem cells, and uh, just as uh, Shinya had uh, described the creation of iPS cells, uh, Marius had uh, also uh, described uh, the human iPS generation and refinements, he used that model, that system to model Parkinson's disease and make discoveries related to, to Parkinson's disease. And then, as I mentioned, he was recruited to Stanford. Uh, there, he has uh, started off on a new path of work that he'll share with you today, which is to take the concept of cellular reprogramming, and, uh, but apply it to what now we term direct cellular reprogramming, specifically for neurons and converting non-neuronal cells directly into neurons. He also had uh, been very interested in uh, finding a way to uh, utilize iPS cells for therapies. And uh, he'll share with you some beautiful work he's done in collaboration with Tony Oro in, the, in dermatology to use iPS-derived cells uh, for a very rare condition known as epidermal lysis bullosa, where they're making a lot of progress, particularly with the help of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Uh, Marius has been recognized uh, for his work by many, uh, and most recently was uh, named a Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, faculty scholar. Uh, he has been uh, supported with his family, who are here today. Uh, his wife, uh, Gerlinda, is a, a pathologist, a hemopathologist herself, and is another physician scientist. And his sons, Felix and Leonidas, are here as well. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Hero and Betty really wanted us to recognize the families uh, in this, so let's all give them a round of applause as well. Um, so uh, at this time, 
Uh, before you get, hear from Marius, I'd like to, uh, to invite uh, Shinya to the stage to say a few words about uh, Hero and Betty and how they came about to be associated with this here at Gladstone uh, and to uh, support this prize. And then you'll hear from Andy Ogawa, uh, Hero and Betty's son. Shinya? Good morning. So uh, when you think your life, there must be a small number of people who are essential in your life. Without them, your life would be very different. It would be less meaningful. Uh, to me, Betty and Hiro Ogawa are certainly among those very small number of people. Without Hiro and Betty, my life and my wife Chika's life are very different. Because of them, we had a great time, wonderful time, beautiful time, especially in US. I met the beautiful couple Hiro and Betty, here at Gladstone, in this auditorium, actually, 10 years ago. They supported Gladstone, Warner's work. It, I, I believe it started on uh, green <laughs> in the golf club. <laughs> so uh, because of their support to Gladstone, they came to this auditorium, and I met them. Immediately, they became very good friends to me and to Chika, and they became a great mentor to both of us. In the April 2014, uh, they came to my office in Kyoto, and they proposed this prize. They say they wanted to recognize not only a scientist, but also their family, especially spouse, because family and spouse means a lot to us scientists. Without their support, we cannot survive, as you all know. So at that time, they are busy. They are on the way to the airport back to San Francisco. So we promised to discuss the prize in more detail in May when I'm here again. But very sadly, uh, just a few hours I landed at SS SF4, Betty all of a sudden passed away. So to me, this uh, prize is the very last wish of Betty. And as you know, our hero passed away last October. So uh, I'm sorry, that's December. So since then, this award means even a lot to me. This award is a very strong connection between Hiro and Betty and myself and also Chika. Uh, this year, as you heard from Deepak, this award will go to Marius. I have a sto small story <laughs> with him. Uh, I think it was in 2003, I visited uh, Bonn University. I met uh, many students, and one of them was very busy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very busy. I don't have enough time to talk to you <laughs> <laughs> because I need to go to the airport. So I asked him, uh, what are you going to do in the States? And he said, I'm going to join Rudolf Yenish lab as a postdoc. Because I knew how, how tough, how competitive uh, Rudolf Yenish's lab was, I could only tell him good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and 15 years later, the same student is here. <laughs> it was Marius. So he did very well. <laughs> <laughs> <wish> yes. <laughs> Thanks to your beautiful 
family. <laughs> Let me go back to uh, Hiro and Betty. They have a beautiful family. Uh, they have two sons, Andy and Marcus. And I'm very happy that one of his sons, Andy, is with us today. So oh, let me uh, introduce Andy, uh, Betty, and uh, Hero's beautiful son. Andy, please come up to the podium. Mm -hmm. uh, Shinya san, thank you very much for those uh, very kind words of introduction. My parents' uh, friendship to you and Chika um, was very, very special. Um, Dr. Yamanaka invited uh, them also to join him when he received the Nobel Prize in uh, Stockholm. And that was uh, one of their highlights in their life. They always talked about how uh, incredible of an experience that was. So yes, it's been about a uh, little over four years since this prize was established. And um, I'm very happy that we can continue to uh, award these prizes, but without the support of Gladstone, Deepak, and, and Megan, as well as Yamanaka Sensei, um, you know, this wouldn't happen. So, you know, as uh, unfortunately dad passed away in December, but I'm trying my best to continue to uh, honor this tradition, and with the support of Gladstone and Yamanaka Sensei, we're gonna continue to make this happen. Um, the uh, award recipient, Marius, is the, I, I believe, the youngest uh, recipient of this award up until now. And my father, as an entrepreneur, always uh, wanted to support young, ambitious um, um, leaders, you know. So I'm glad that, award, that you're, you're re receiving this award this year. Also, um, he, you know, as Deepak and, and Yamanaka Sensei has uh, already um, mentioned, the spouse plays such an important part in providing that support, atmosphere, environment, making things happen. So, you know, once again, um, uh, I believe Gerlinda, uh, we should give her a big applause for all of her great support and work. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, and um, looking forward now to uh, uh, having Marius um, receive the award. Thank you. So at this time, Marius gets to receive his uh, very special uh, $150,000 check. <laughs> but more importantly, <laughs> please come here. I think the, um, I don't know what I did with the check. <laughs> not so important. <laughs> That's not so important. This is the prize. So this, please, please come up here. This is a very special uh, piece that's been... Uh, uh, designed here and commissioned um, by an artist in New York, I believe, and uh, it uh, uh, is the top of the land is meant to be the Waddington landscape, uh, which illustrates the concept of cellular reprogramming. Uh, and maybe Andy, if you could uh, present that to Marius. I'll, I'll hold this for you, and, uh, and then now we can hear from Marius, and he can share with you his wonderful science. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, I'm speechless. <laughs> this uh, is very difficult to follow, all, all these um, previous speakers here. Um, and what is there left for me to say, then, how honored I feel uh, to, to receive this really prestigious award, in particular the Ogawa Yamanaka Prize. When, when Deepak called me uh, on the phone to tell me the news, I you know, was deeply moved and um, I realized that this is actually one of the most wonderful moments in the life of a scientist to be recognized by your colleagues in, in, in such, such an amazing way. So first and foremost, I also wanted to join in and um, and acknowledge um, Betty and um, Hiro Ogawa, who I was lucky enough to still meet, and it's very sad that they cannot be with us uh, today anymore. Um, I was truly impressed how visionary these two, P these two individuals were. Even though they had no basic training in, in biology or medicine, they recognized the 
amazing potential of our field of cellular reprogramming and, and all these, you know, really groundbreaking new developments that are yet to come and establish this, uh, this prize to recognize this, uh, this then nascent field. Um, I am convinced that we live in one of the most exciting times in the recent history of biomedical research. The prospects are, are just amazing. The realization that we can take a skin cell or a blood cell, convert that into a pluripotent stem cell or any other cell type at our desire, have already shown and gained insight into fundamental cell biological, human biological processes. And we have also learned using these techniques about new disease mechanisms. But the next big step is that we'll use these cells as a therapy themselves based on a cell transportation approach. So most medicines today are small molecules, small chemical compounds. And now compare a small molecule with an entire cell. How much more adjustable, how much more intelligent, how much more powerful is an entire cell compared to a small little compound? Of course, it's uh, a highly complex biological system. Those cells are living things, and they need to be under good control. And we have to make sure that they don't co cause any harm after transportation. And, and uh, there needs to be a lot of investigation. But I'm very confident that you know, our field will have developed ways in the future that will have 100% control over the lineage identity to make sure that we don't um, have any adverse side effects. But there's another really important property, I think, in particular of these pluripotent stem cells, which is that they are very easily genetically manipulated. And these two tools that we have in hand, reprogramming on the one and genetic engineering in the other, just opens up our possibilities enormously. I think that the sky is the limit in, in, in our ways, how we can think how the next generation therapies will look like. I think our vision is way beyond the conventional idea of regenerative medicine. We'll not only be able to regrow cells and organs for tissues that have been lost, we will be able to generate smart cells, cell grafts that are able to recognize and monitor disease processes and interpret this and react in a very specific way to attack the um, pathogenetic mechanisms in this way. I think this is still the way of in the future, but I have no doubt that this is the direction that we are heading, and I cannot, well, I'm, 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 you know, I'm so happy that I'm here at this day to, to witness this, this field develop, and I'm envy. I'm envying all these young medical and, uh, and PhD students that go into this field right now, and they will probably uh, witness the full potential of, of our field in, in their lifetimes. All right. Um, in moments like this, when you um, are recognized with such a prestigious award, of course, you start to think um, how this all came about. And you realize there are many, many people that were required for this to happen and are the reason why I'm standing here on this stage. Some of the people were already mentioned by my previous speakers, but the, perhaps the two most obvious people that are responsible for my pure existence are, of course, my parents. <laughs> Without them, I wouldn't be here. Um, particularly thankful to my father, who insisted I should study medicine, even though I thought this was a really stupid idea. And maybe I still think that. <laughs> It was already mentioned that I have a very nice, uh, helpful uh, family, my wife and, and my, my children. The, as it was mentioned, the spouse is uh, ra rarely acknowledged in these occasions. I'm very happy that you know, uh, um, Betty and, and Hero um, specifically made the point of that because it's true. 
that you uh, need a partner in life. And um, in this partnership, you help each other out all the time. And uh, with, without this stabilization, it would not be that easy. And of course, my two little boys, uh, which are probably by far the youngest people in this audience today. <laughs> and not asleep yet. Of course, I'm very grateful to my mentors, uh, Rudi Balling, Oliver Brüssel, and, and Rudolf Jenisch. They really taught me how to think scientifically, how to keep the highest possible standards. It, you know, it does not make sense to waste your time with, with something that is not 100% you know, correct, and, and it needs to be a solid proof. Right? That's the absolute basis. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I was taught this very, very early, early on in time. And also, to think big. I just used the word visionary. That's really important too. Right? I mean, you can spend your time with many, many things that may help to make small incremental uh, changes, but you can also spend your time to try to work on something really fundamental that will have a big impact on society. I have many, many great collaborators at Stanford. It's too many to, to go through them uh, all. But of course, the environment, the scientific environment at your institution has a big impact on, on how you think. Your, your new ideas are created when you walk across the aisle and there is you know, an engineer thinking about the problem in a completely different way. That's been really, really exciting. So I'm very, um, very grateful for all these people. And of course, all the people in my lab that have been with me now since 10 years. Um, I'm very happy to see many of them here in, in the audience. And those are the people that I work with every day and they, um, they uh, show me the excitement. Whenever there's a new finding, a new data, they drag me to the microscope and I'm, I'm lucky to be able to share all these exciting moments. So thank you all for, for this uh, partnership as well. And then lastly, there were two scientists that made two important scientific discoveries that really shaped my, my career. And this is Ian Wilmut when he cloned Dolly the sheep. I was a young medical student, and with that experiment, I was, you know, sold. I was, it was clear, I have to go into the field of reprogramming and, and, and stem cell biology. And of course, Shinya's groundbreaking discovery that just a small handful of transcription factors can install pluripotency in, in somatic cells. This, of course, as you all know, changed the world and uh, was really the basis for you know, my entire research um, program that I started in my independent career. All right, let me jump into, uh, into the scientific part of, of my presentation. One of the main interests that in our lab is the, um, and to try to understand the molecular mechanisms of cell lineage identity. And in particular, we are um, interested in how neurons are formed um, during normal development. And the um, critical cellular and molecular substrate of cell identity is, of course, the combinations of transcription factors being expressed in these cells and the specific chromatin state these cells are in. So this is just another example to illustrate how powerful epigenetics is. Even with the same genome, you can have two vastly different phenotypes. And the same is, of course, also true on the cellular level. So when you think about um, how neurons are formed, there are really three main steps that these cells have to, uh, to undergo through. First, the neuronal identity has to be induced then these cells typically mature, and once the neurons are made, there need to be mechanisms in place that maintain their identity. And we set out to first start um, asking questions about the problem of neuronal induction. Following the well-known dictum of Richard Feynman, what I cannot create, I do not understand, we set out to try to generate neurons from scratch. And of course, as I just mentioned, following Shinya's great example, we actually managed to find three specific transcription factors called ASA1, bit one like and BRAIN2 that were very efficiently converting fibroblasts into 
induced neuronal cells, uh, as, as we call them. Very importantly, these uh, induced neuronal cells had the two main functional properties of neurons, namely they were able to fire action potentials and to form functional synapses. And we showed this in uh, a tight and important collaboration with Tom Sudow's lab at the time. Over the years, we have explored various different cells as donor cell types for this, this reprogramming, and we found that a bunch of different cell types can actually reprogram with very similar combinations of, of transcription factors, including both um, endodermal as well as mesodermal um, lineage cells to go into a neuronal cell that reprints ectodermal uh, origin. And I may be most proud of our most recent accomplishment to convert adult human lymphocytes directly into neurons. And um, this was accomplished with these four factors, AS1, BRIN2, mit one leg and ENGINE2. Um, you see how beautiful the cell morphology are changed from sort of very round, lymphocytic, you know, unspectacular morphologies to this beautiful, complex, dendritic uh, morphologies of, of a neuron. We also found a combination of small molecules to improve the reprogramming process. And importantly, these blood-derived N cells were also able to functionally integrate into pre-existing neural networks. So now that we knew what kind of factors are uh, needed to induce neuronal identity, we now wanted to understand how these work. And for the um, next part of the talk, I would like to focus on this one transcription factor called mid one like There was very little known about this gene um, other than its domain structure. It's a zinc finger domain containing protein. There's three clusters of these zinc fingers scattered around on the, on the protein sequence. And it's a remarkable expression pattern. It turns out that mid one like is very specifically expressed in neurons and at the same time expressed in virtually all neurons. So expression pattern very tightly associated with neuronal identity. So we first asked, where is mid one like binding in a genome? And we generated our own antibodies to do this experiment. This is a, a chromatin IP or chip seq experiment. And we uh, generated um, uh, or, or tissues from, from fetal brain. Since it's specifically expressed, we only pull out the, uh, um, the DNA from neurons specifically, and we found a couple thousand specific sites in the genome is indeed bound by mid one like We found a unique motif enriched under these, these sites, presumably the DNA binding recognition site, and that um, a, a, about half of the sites were actually very close to transcription uh, start sites and like other transcription factors, which tend to bind more distal regulatory elements, but one like seems to be binding right at the promoter in, in most cases. So this is the binding pattern in primary neurons and in, in normal neurons. How about where is mid one like binding in these fibroblasts as they reprogram into neurons? And the surprise was that the binding pattern of this transcription factor was very similar in these fibroblasts when they're infected only with mid one leg or with all three transcription factors, then in neurons. So this is bizarre. Why would a such neuronal specific transcription factor be able to bind a very similar binding pattern in fibroblasts and in neurons? Well, we assumed perhaps mid one leg is one of these pioneer factors, which are factors uh, that are able to open and, and bind an open closed chromatin to pioneer, in that sense, uh, this new lineage. So we asked, well, how does this chromatin state look like at the mid one leg target sites before mid one leg is being there expressed? So it's just the state of the fibroblasts. And very much to our surprise, uh, we noticed that the mid one leg binding sites are preferentially in the open chromatin configuration. So that explains why mid one like can bind in fibroblasts, but it's, it's, it raises another conundrum. Why on earth should all these neuronal target sites be in open and uh, accessible chromatin configuration in, in these fibroblasts? Well, we got the first hint 
of this uh, conundrum when we looked at the transcriptional output of, these, uh, of, of mid one leg. And both, as you can see in the heat map here, as well as on the average uh, ex expression uh, plot here, we noticed that the majority of the mid one leg targets are actually rather down-regulated than activated, suggesting that mid one leg may be a transcriptional repressor. Well, at that, at that point, I was, you know, pulling the brake here because this didn't make so much sense to me. How would such a powerful reprogramming factor that is inducing you know, a completely new lineage in Fireblast, how could that be a transcriptional repressor? You know, of course you can argue a repressor can repress another repressor which leads to activation, but that is really a very passive mechanism. This is more like a de-repression of some pre-existing programs. I didn't assume that that could be strong enough to really drive the, um, you know, a cell into a completely new cell fate. So that's why I really wanted to get to the bottom of this problem and came up with a functional experiment. So Moritz Mahl in the lab, when he was a postdoc, he took apart the, uh, the sequence of mid one leg and identified the critical domain that is, that, that is uh, the, uh, interacting with the DNA, the DNA binding domain, and fused this little fragment here together with either a transcriptional repressor or a transcriptional activator. And then ran these construct constructs in our reprogramming assay. And as you can see here, compared to the full length uh, wild type sequence of mid one leg, um, the engraved uh, repressive version of mid one leg clearly supports reprogramming, whereas the activating version of mid one leg completely eliminates the system. Clearly arguing that indeed, the transcriptional repression of mid one leg is the dominant role of mid one leg in reprogramming. So as in so many uh, cases, I was wrong. This experiment you know, clearly demonstrates that repression is critical, but I just told you, you know, we, we tried to, to, um, to get our brain around this, and turns out though, when you think about it, it actually does make a lot of sense. Because when you turn one cell type into another, exactly two things have to happen. First, of course, you have to induce the target program of the, of, the, of the new lineage. But you also have to silence the original donor cell identity. Because if you wouldn't do that, you would end up in some sort of Frankensteinian hybrid identity, like a fibro neuronal cell, right? Which we, by the way, knew that, that didn't exist because we had um, looked before at this silencing the program and, and documented it's, it's, it's really gone. So we thought maybe that is what mid one leg is doing. Maybe mid one leg's main role is to shut down the fireblast identity. And sure enough, that's exactly what, uh, what it looks like when we overlay um, the mid one leg target genes with a fireblast um, specific signature gene list. There's a highly significant enrichment of, the, uh, of, these, of these two lists. And also, um, uh, yeah, so, so coming down to, the, um, to this a fairly simple model that mid one leg may just repress the fibroblast identity, and there might be other factors such as AC1, which I that we started earlier and I didn't have time to talk about, is there to activate the neural program. So a fairly simple two um, sort of pronged um, approach how this reprogramming work works and why also these two transcription factors work so well together um, in, in in this team, sort of perfect complementary roles. But then we also wondered, what is mid one leg actually doing in the brain? It didn't make too much sense that there would be a, a transcription factor being made in the brain that is specifically repressing a fibroblast identity. You know, fibroblast and neurons have really nothing much in common, so that's just a cell type we picked because it's easy to work with in, in, in the lab. So there's no, nothing special about them. So maybe uh, mid one leg does more. And when we looked at the target genes a little bit more closer, we found that there were actually a lot of signaling pathways and, and other transcriptional regulators important for many different lineages um, during development being, being bound and repressed by the one leg. Furthermore, when we do a GO term analysis, um, asking what kind of, kind of uh, biological terms are enriched um, with this gene list of mid one leg targets, 
we noticed a lot of non-neuronal terms, like I uh, highlighted a few of them, cartilage, heart, and lung development. Many non-neuronal terms are be, be, being, being enriched, suggesting that um, indeed mid one leg may be silencing a lot of these other non-neuronal programs. And finally, we also f uh, could show in a functional experiment that mid, mid one leg is able to block the very strong myoD-induced muscle formation in, in fibroblasts. So taken together, we arrive at this model that mid one leg may be this proneuronal, but everything but, or most program, but neuronal repressor, right? Sort of, sort of this, um, this specifically, specific neuronal transcription factor that takes care of many, many, many other lineages, leaving the neuronal program here open to activate for other proneural factors, such as, for example, ACL1. So that mechanism would be the exact inverse to this famous transcriptional repressor called REST. That is a transcriptional repressor that is specifically repressing the neuronal programs or the neural program in many non-neuronal tissues. So it's the exact sort of inverse mechanism, it looks like, that a mid one leg is using compared to REST. So when you think about it, from an evolutionary point of view, it is very straightforward to conceptualize how a new lineage and a factor that is inducing that lineage can co-evolve because there's a tight correlation be between the existence of this new lineage and this, and this new factor. However, in this case, it's much harder to understand how evolution can, can, can select for, 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 for these sequences there because the correlation between you know, a factor that is repressing many, many different tissues and the identity and number of these non-neuronal tissues, of course, vary in evolutionary time and in different animals. There's different types of other you know, non-neuronal um, um, uh, lineages. So how can evolution really make this happen? How, how can you come up with such a mechanism? So that's why we're really curious. How are the DNA binding motifs of mid one leg distributed uh, in the genome? And the results were actually very clear. When we plotted the frequency of mid one leg uh, binding uh, motifs in um, many non-neuronal somatic cells, as well as in neural promoters, we saw that there is a specific depletion of this mid one leg motif in neural promoters, and inversely, um, specific enrichment of the mid one leg motifs in non-neural promoters. So we don't understand, or I have really don't understand how evolution did it, but somehow it managed to select specifically for all these non-neural somatic programs. And as a control, we also plotted the distribution of the rest motifs. <coughs> and as expected, that is highly enriched in neural promoters and depleted in non-neural promoter sequences. So the next question, of course, was what is um, what, what, what could mid one like be doing with, with this sort of the pan non-neuronal uh, repression function in, in the brain? And th would that have an effect on also the neuronal identity itself? So to, to answer th that question, we established primary neuronal cultures and um, knocked down mid one like um, in, in, these, in these cultures using two specific hairpins. And as we, uh, what we found is that many non-neural programs highlighted earlier on, on this heat map, which are usually induced during neurogenesis, are specifically deregulated, um, are derepressed in primary uh, neuronal cultures when you deplete mid one leg function in, in these cells. So the next question was whether this derepression of many non-neural programs may have an indirect secondary effect on the neural program itself. And we therefore took the same system, primary cultures that were depleted with, uh, with mid one leg hairpins as shown here. And we, when we ran some um, Western plots and quantified um, neuronal proteins and their abundance, many of them were not changed as expected. You know, the, the neurons were still there, they did, didn't disappear or, or uh, change completely the morphology, but there were some uh, proteins that actually had quite some sub substantial uh, depletion in these cultures, including some synaptic proteins. 
We also wanted to analyze the functional consequences of the mid one leg depletion by electrophysiology. And um, again, some parameters like capacitance, input resistance, and memory potential were not significantly changed um, when mid one leg was depleted. However, when we injected current into the cells and measured the ability of these cells to generate action potentials, we noticed that there was indeed a um, specific uh, defect in these cells in their ability to fire action potentials. So taking everything together now, we think we have discovered a new mechanism how neurons can maintain their, neur their neuronal identity throughout um, adult life. It seems to be important to have a continued and active repression of many non-neuronal cell fates that is enabling the cells to maintain their proper neuronal program and with that their, um, their normal neural properties. All right, so I hope I still have a few um, more minutes because I also wanted to um, share with you our other exciting uh, research program, which is much more translational and goes more in line with my you know, visionary statements that I made in the beginning, so the idea where, where we want to go to. Unfortunately, we are very far away from these, from these great ideas that I outlined in the beginning. We still are doing baby steps, but that's what we have to do in order to get to the goal. So I actually showed this slide almost exactly 10 years ago at a student retreat in Asilomar. And uh, there was one person in the audience, uh, his name is Tony Oro, he's at Stanford's de Dermatology Department. And I had outlined, this was you know, very short, and maybe for two years after Shinya's discovery of iPS cells. And already then, you know, I thought, you know, this is great to put this together with genetics. And we could really now treat monogenetic diseases uh, in this way, where we would take a um, skin biopsy, for example, and uh, reprogram them, fix uh, a disease-causing mutation, um, have the cells repaired, differentiate them into some donor cells, which would then lead to a, a curative transmutation approach. And Tony came up to me after, after this talk and said, I have the disease, the disease for you. And that disease is called dystrophic epidermis bullosa. That is a skin disease that is caused by collagen mutations, which is responsible for um, keeping the epidermal layer of the skin with the dermal layer of the skin together. And when these collagens uh, are absent, you can essentially peel off the epidermal layers in these, in these children. It's a horrible disease. You can imagine that these wounds, they can never heal because the epidermis cannot attach. And there's a permanent inflammatory uh, response which eventually causes cancer and kills the patients. So the skin is an accessible organ for a highly experimental new cell therapy, this has many, many advantages. If something goes wrong, you see it right away. You can take it out very easily if, let's say, like the cells would cause a tumor or so. And the effect of the, of the graft should be very obvious because we know exactly what the problem is. We know that these collagens are missing. If we make cells that produce collagen, these epidermal cells, keratinocytes that produce collagen, this, these wounds should be healed. So we thought this is a, you know, a great disease as a first step to show that we can actually develop such kind of more complex cell therapies. So we got together and uh, with the help of um, you know, many of my, my and Tony's uh, lab members, we, we were successfully able, of course, to reprogram um, skin cells from these patients into iPS cells. Um, we were able to repair the genetic defect using various approaches, and we were lucky that the collagen locus is actually very easy to target. You see here, the targeting for, um, efficiencies are fairly high, sometimes even up to 50% in this one case. And also, in Tony's lab, they did a fantastic job to differentiate these uh, ES and IPS cells, including patient uh, IPS cells, into keratinocytes that um, seem functionally and uh, biochemically indistinguishable from primary skin-derived um, epidermal cells. And importantly, in this, in this proof of concept um, study here, we were able to reprogram an EB patient uh, fibroblast into, into IPS cells, correct the mutation, differentiate them into, into keratinocytes, produce sheets of epithelial uh, layers, so essentially you produce a little um, epidermis in the, in the culture dish, and then graft the uh, 
um, the sheets onto the back of, a, of an immune-compromised mouse. And Tony's lab was able to demonstrate that you can actually grow human skin that produces collagen 7 in the skin on the back of a mouse. So that was important proof of concept paper. And then, of course, the next step was to think, how can we translate this now into the clinic? And if we would have sticked to the exact same protocol that we had done in the lab, this would have been the outline of the cell manufacturing process that we have, we have to do in a clinical grade setting to actually develop this kind of therapy. So it included on the order of like nine different steps and four or five cell banks. All of them would have to be quality controlled with you know, clear approved assays and so forth and so forth. So we were you know, excited to go this path and we tried actually. Um, with, with, the, with the support of, of CERM, and we learned a lot along the way, but it also became clear that this is a maybe a little bit too complex um, approach to actually make this a clinical reality. So we kept thinking and thought, how about we try to shortcut the, the key step, which is the, actually the main time that the cells are in culture, and by the way, keep accumulating mutations, which I think is way more important than any potential off-targets effect of CRISPR um, constructs or so forth. So how about we could try to maybe bypass something, and how about we try to reprogram the starting fibroblasts and correct these fibroblasts at the same time? So as we would reprogram the patient cells, we would at the same time already fix the mutation. And, and the colonies that, that we pick would be automatically, um, or some of them, would be automatically repaired if, of course, the target efficiency is high enough. So that was our, our idea. And of course, you know, other people in the field had already thought along those lines and reported some, some successes. And uh, the great news is, for one, this would dramatically simplify the clinical manufacturing process. So now this actually would become a very viable and, and, uh, and um, implementable um, approach. And the other great news is that this actually seems to work very, very well. We have about 5% targeting efficiencies in these fibroblasts as they reprogram to, to iPS cells. And this is an, an experiment um, where the um, allele frequency is measured by a method called digital droplet PCR. And there is a few colonies that have about half of the cells are perfectly um, corrected. And we can essentially pick this colony maybe two or so three weeks after the, after the seeding of the fibroblast, and then move these cells directly into the differentiation process. So we're very excited about this, um, this project and that will hopefully move this into the, clin in, into the clinic, not so much uh, down the road in the future. All right, I would like now to thank all the people that made this happen. I acknowledged many of my personal um, friends and family members in the beginning, but here's the, all the people in the lab that contributed to the uh, data I've shown to you today. In particular, Koji Tanabe, who is sitting right over there, and Jean, they were responsible for the blood to neuron uh, conversion. I mentioned, I think, Moritz Mal uh, and Mike Carita. Those two people spearheaded the uh, mid one project uh, in the lab, and Gernot Neumeyer um, and Maturi, who just joined the lab, so she's not on there yet, are working on the uh, EB project uh, that, that I showed you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marius, for a wonderful lecture, and congratulations again. I, I didn't mention earlier, but you can tell in his creativity of his work uh, that he's an artist as well. Uh, he's, Marius is an accomplished uh, musician, pianist, is that, do I recall correctly? Yeah. Uh, concert pianist, and I think you can see it's just the you know that's what it takes in science is a lot of creativity, and I think those two probably go together. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Steve. Hey, Marius, great talk. Um, I have wondered for the uh, for the protocol to convert uh, lymphocytes into neurons. So one of the challenges 
for using iPS cells to study neurodegenerative diseases, for example, is that aging is a key factor. And one thought has been that a more direct approach, like the one you described, could preserve some of the epigenetic marks of aging. That's been shown in fibroblasts, but have you looked in the blood cells? Do you see if any of that aging signature gets retained? Um, very good question. We have the data, Koji, right? We, we did the expression profile, but we, we didn't specifically look at the aging program, yeah. So I, I totally agree. It, to me, it makes a lot of sense, and uh, Rustic Age had some, uh, some data along those lines that, that seemed co quite convincing. And um, the, the, the relevant um, question will be whether these aging-associated epigenetic marks will be the same, right, in different cell types. So who knows, maybe in the lymphocytes there will be a different set of epigenetic marks than you would need the ones in neurons. So, so maybe if you just preserve the lymphocyte-specific ones, it may not be so helpful. Who knows? But if they are the same um, in all our different cell types, then uh, I think it would be really exciting. Marius, maybe, uh, could you, Bruce, did you have a question? Go ahead. Bruce. I mean, it's very impressive how it's impressive how you've been able to grow skin cells from the from uh, you know you know, improve on those techniques. And I, I know you sort of skipped on that, but that's really tremendous. The um, do you think you could also potentially uh, ever do editing directly on uh, the skin uh, uh, and uh, use essentially your uh, your skin models, your IPS-derived skin models, as a model for the uh, editing process, because essentially, theoretically, you could potentially even edit uh, correctly a relatively small percent and maybe correct all, everything. Yes, absolutely. Great remark. So actually, Tony has taken exactly that idea, um, and there is one type of EB of this disease that is affecting the uh, specific adhesion molecule, laminin mutation, I believe, uh, which you can, uh, um, which then leads, once corrected, to a better attachment when you have a specific um, sort of integrin uh, uh, coated dish. So that worked really, really well. The problem, though, is that the primary cells in culture, they have um, specific, a certain lifetime. Unlike IPS cells, which are truly, we think, rejuvenated, they are truly embryonic-like cells and can, don't lose any you know, juvenile properties, any somatic cells, if you put them in culture, they will age. They will become senescent at some point. Keratin cells are not so bad. You can grow them up pretty well. You know, this, that's what people do, for example, for burned victims. Um, so it's, it's remarkable what, what you can do. Um, but the, the, there, is, there is limits. But that's, that's what Tony tells me. Um, to, to, to some degree, you know, it might be possible, but it, the, the full scaling will be very, very challenging. Marius, what about the potential for using the induced neuronal, neuron technology in vivo for, to generate new neurons? Sure, sure. That's also an exciting um, approach that um, we have not so much uh, followed up on, but there's, there's a number of groups that, that um, are working on that. Again, you need good control over this lineage conversion, when you think ahead, um, not sure what the FDA would think uh, if you use such an irreversible you know, cell lineage change because the neurons have to come from somewhere, right? Um, and so you will deplete some cell types and gain some, some more. But you know, everything is a risk-benefit um, um, balance, right? So you know, I'm personally very excited about this, uh, about this principle approach, in particular when you take uh, cells that can very easily migrate into the brain, such as um, hematopoietic-derived cells, which can, as we have seen now in the lab too, can very efficiently migrate into the brain and then become microglia-like cells. And if you like the combination of control over cell and identity in this scenario is, is really, uh, really exciting. Great. All right. Well, join me in thanking uh, Marius and congratulating him for this wonderful work.